Hi guys, my name is Aaron, good to see you. And I'm Anna, and today we're going to be talking about being an underdog. Now usually when people find themselves in this position, it's not something they're very excited about. Aaron, have you ever found yourself in that position of being an underdog? Actually, yes. So, it may not look like it, but I used to be a competitive swimmer. And one year we were at nationals, and there were 70 people swimming my swim and I was ranked 45th. Now, you have to make the top 16 to move on, so I thought, there's no way this is happening, but I had the race of my lifetime and I got 15th. That's amazing, hey, good job. Uh, today we're gonna be tracking with Moses on how he went from being an underdog in the worst possible way to partnering with God in the most amazing way. Let's check out today's God story. <laughs> And the Lord said to John, come forth and you shall receive eternal life. But John came fifth and so got a toaster. Hey everybody, Jamie Robertson here. I am glad to be with you again. I wanna start off by telling you a story. It's a friend of mine's story. And he, at that time he had a two year old daughter and she was working the Venetian blinds. You know what I mean by Venetian blinds? Just sort of those, those slatted ones that have those weird strings and the little turny bits and stuff. So again, she's two years old and she just wants the blinds to go up, but she's pulling one string and like part of them are going up and then she's pulling it, it's going like that. And, and she's getting increasingly frustrated. So he comes over to give her a hand. He's like, here honey, let me help you with that. And she turns on him. She looks at him, puts her little hands on her little hips and says, no daddy, me do it. When he was telling me this story, he said, for him, that was that quintessential moment. This is, this is how often we are with God. No, daddy, me do it. And you wanna know why? It's because we can't see that far. We don't know that much. And so what our lesson today is we look at the Pharaoh, we look at Moses, we look at this, this incredible story from the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, is figuring out our big idea that God's way is the best way. Okay, so our story today takes place in Egypt. Now, if you remember back to the time of Joseph, the, the Israeli people had come down to Egypt because of a famine in their own land. And over time, they'd actually become quite numerous. There were a lot of them living in Egypt. And so the Pharaoh, which is the king of Egypt, for lack of a better term, was getting concerned that there were so many of these people that weren't actually Egyptian. If another country wanted to turn them against him, they could and then he'd have a whole bunch of people against him inside his own land. So he comes up with a fairly diabolical plan that we're gonna wipe out all the male babies. We're gonna, we're gonna thin the herd. So Pharaoh's plan was to have all the midwives kill any baby boys that are born. Now Moses' mom knew about this, and so when she gave birth to Moses, she hit him for three months. But if any of you have been around babies, you know they're not exactly quiet. So after three months, she, she figured out that she could no longer hide them. So she goes down to the Nile River. She takes a bunch of papyrus reeds and, and sews them together into a bit of a basket, lays her three-month-old baby into the river, into the basket in the river, and then sends it up the river. Now, Moses had a sister by the name of Miriam, and this is where our story picks up in Exodus chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Now, the baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the river bank. Now, when the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Now, I want you to stop and think about this for a second. A mom placing her baby in the Nile River. If you go to the Nile River today, they tell you to be careful. It's full of crocodiles. It's full of hippos, which kill more people than crocodiles. This is a three-month-old, totally defenseless. I mean, I can't think of a more either reckless, but as we see in this story, faithful decision a mom can make. It went so much better than she could have ever hoped. Her son ends up with the Pharaoh's daughter, the daughter of the very man who ordered her child to be killed. And this is incredible because the story gets even better. You remember at the beginning, Moses' older sister Miriam is watching. So what I didn't read here, but how the story continues on, is that Miriam goes up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, do you want me to find a Hebrew woman uh, to feed the baby? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, that actually be very, very helpful. So who does Miriam go find? Moses' mom, her mom. So her mom comes back to feed her baby. And Pharaoh's daughter says, thank you for doing this. I'm gonna pay you to do this. I mean, God's way is the best way. Are you kidding me? 
Not only does Moses get to live, but, but she actually gets gainfully employed in Pharaoh's household, just feeding her child. This story turned out amazingly. It's, it's truly miraculous and nothing that Moses' mom could have ever hoped to see coming. There's a lot of characters in this story and I want to highlight a couple. We've already talked about the faithfulness of Moses' mom. We talked about the, the sisterly love of Miriam, but also the compassion of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, her father had no use for the Hebrews, saw them as a threat. And you got to figure, being raised in his household, she could have very easily thought the same way. But she took pity on the child. She had compassion. Do you see how God was at work, not just to, to keep the baby safe on the river, but worked in the heart of Pharaoh's daughter? And this is a theme we're going to come back to when we start to look at the heart of Pharaoh himself. But it's the compassion in Pharaoh's daughter that brought a blessing into her own home. For she raised Moses as her own child. And this is going to have massive ramifications for all the Jewish Hebrew people. When I say God's way is the best way, that's not a bumper sticker. My whole life is a testimony of, of things not working out how, when, or where I wanted them to. And it's only as I grow older and can look back and be like, if that had actually happened, that thing I wanted so bad, my life would have been drastically different and I don't think better. I'm so grateful God knows my path better than I could ever possibly know it because most of the fun of being a person of faith is finding out this stuff, is being open to God revealing miraculous plans bigger than you could ever hope for in your life. So as we're going to go into all these stories, this amazing story about this incredible life of Moses, I want you to always keep in the back of your mind that God's ways truly are the best ways. That is a much better way of handling life rather than just looking at God and saying, no daddy, me do it. Okay, that's it for now. I am me, you are you. Both of those things make me very happy and I'll see you next time. So Pharaoh made a plan to get rid of all the baby boys in Egypt, but God also made a plan that ended up saving Moses' life. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and it totally reminds me of this week's big idea, which is that God's way is the best way. Do you agree? Absolutely. I think so many times we make plans for ourselves, thinking that we know best, but if we would just surrender our plans to God's, I think we'd get a surprise or two. Yeah, and we've got a story for you from Lauren. Now, I want you guys to take notice that she had plans and they didn't exactly work out the way she wanted, but you know what? Let's just check it out. I was always an average student in high school. I never got super great grades, but I excelled in music. I grew up in a Christian home, but there's a blessing and a curse to that experience because you're surrounded by beautiful, beautiful people with wonderful relationships with God. And I found myself making their relationships with God my own. And sometimes I would find myself looking at the things I was good at, saying, wow, I'm good at a lot of things. There's a lot of things I can do. I think God wants me to go here. God wants me to go there. I realized that I wasn't asking God. I wasn't seeking God. Instead, I was just assuming where he was calling me. My first year of college as a vocal performance major was super successful. Going into my second year of college, I started to notice that I was unable to sing some of the same songs. I was going hoarse. Um, my breath support was less, so I went to a doctor to figure out what was going on. They said that I would either need surgery or I could go on vocal rest and see if it could heal itself, which for me was like a death sentence. So at that point, I realized just how much of my identity was wrapped up in me as a musician. I felt like my friendships started to get rocky. I lost my scholarship because I was unable to meet the requirements of my scholarship. And I started to see that so much of my happiness, so much of my joy came from things that could so easily be taken away. And they were taken away in an instant. I was devastated. I cried my face off for like two weeks straight. I was really upset. 
but the reality of me is that I don't love to live in pain. I wanna make a quick fix and I wanna fix it right away. So I felt like I needed to completely remove myself. I wanted to go on a different track and I decided, hey, I'm gonna do something crazy. I'm gonna go to cosmetology school and learn how to do hair. And it was then, maybe for the first time in my life, that I realized that I was hungry for God. I think I was asking him, what do you want next? I felt like I needed to stop and not take another step before asking him where I should go. After asking God where I should be, I moved back to Minnesota, I met my husband, we have three beautiful children, and I'm experiencing God in a totally different way. Despite all of this, I felt like I still had this yearning for music in my life. And I asked God, God, how can I have music back in my life? And I felt like he said, Lauren, if you desire it, I will make it happen for you. And I felt like he gave me this beautiful wrapped gift. I love God, I love music, and suddenly there was an opening at our church that I love to be a worship leader. So I was given that position and now I get to lead worship for students at the church that I call home. Hallelujah. Most of my life, I thought that my successes are what created my path. It wasn't until my vocal injury that I realized that I am not in control anymore. I had to stop, I had to listen, and that is where abundant life happened for me. My relationship with God deepened immensely, and I was so excited to do the things that He was asking me to do. His way really was the best way for me all along. Wow, what a journey. You know, Lauren was just doing what she thought God wanted her to do. So I think it's amazing she was able to stop and recognize that she wasn't finding the fulfillment she was looking for and decided to seek God first. Yeah, she totally had a plan that was working just fine. And then God reminded her that he had a better way. And when she followed that, she not only found her voice, she found her true self. That's amazing. I think it's a great reminder for us too, that we can be successful in the many things we do, but we should always seek God's way first because it'll be better than we could imagine. Absolutely. Let's break into our small groups and see what this looks like in our own stories.